In the news tonight, an initiative launched to deter young people from negative behavior. It involves visits to Dodd's prison. Discussions to be held in Barbados this week to find solutions to crime in the region. People with high blood pressure and diabetes warned about the impact of extreme heat on their health. And in sports, Venom and Sheldine take home $20,000 each after winning the Barbados Open. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Broom. Thank you for tuning in. We begin with this story. The Caribbean Court of Justice has reserved judgment in the latest hearing arising from efforts to extradite former insurance executive Alex Tasker. The court has also indicated a stay of previous rulings remain in effect until the judgment has been delivered. In the matter before the court, Mr. Tasker is seeking to reopen his application for special leave to appeal to the CCJ. He had appealed for special leave to appeal the decision of the Court of Appeal of Barbados. Now that court had dismissed his attempt to appeal the order for him to surrender to United States authorities to face charges for money laundering and conspiracy to launder money. On July 31st this year, the CCJ dismissed Mr. Tasker's application for special leave on the ground that no arguable case was advanced by him to justify the grant of special leave. Well, in this latest hearing, the CCJ is considering Mr. Tasker's application to reopen his application for special leave, whether the court's decision dismissing his application should be reversed, and if it is, whether his appeal should be allowed. Mr. Tasker has been linked to the scandal involving former government minister Donville Innes, who spent two years in a U.S. jail for his role in a scheme to launder bribe payments from a Barbados-based insurance company through bank accounts in New York. Their calls for the improvement of citizen services and greater exposure to digital literacy in Barbados and across the region. They've been made by several officials at the Caribbean Digital Summit and ICT Week, which have opened at the Accra Hotel. Wendy Burke reports. There's a view without the successful use of technology, many sectors in Barbados will not grow. Minister responsible for MIST, Davidson Ishmael, says that's why Barbados is working on a strategy. Barbados continues to make steady progress along its digital transformation journey. Discussions at this digital summit will help us in refining our digital strategies in light of us having to operate within an environment where there are rapidly occurring technological advancements and an almost constant chorus of change. This summit will also provide significant insights which can and will assist Barbados with the development of its digital workforce. In addition, there are several other elements of digital transformation that will be discussed, which would no doubt be of immense value to us as a ministry and a government. The expert advisor to the Global Government Forum, Kevin Cunnington, says they have been analysing digital transformation across the globe. I've spoken to about a third of the world's countries like this about their issues with digital and their solutions to the issues that they face. And for those of you who are staying with us this afternoon, you will all be given this free of charge digital playbook which explains two and a half years of research. What's gone well for countries, what's gone badly, and where we found best practice. And also, very helpfully at the back, to Donna's request from uh, the, civil, the heads of civil service, there's a blueprint on how to do it properly. The head of the CTU, Rodney Taylor, wants digital tools created to improve services to the citizens of the region. In today's environment, one of the most pressing challenges is to keep pace with rapidly changing technology. There's a constant state of flux with new tools, platforms, and innovation emerging almost daily. AI, for example, um, artificial intelligence is open, opening a whole new world of possibilities for public service delivery. So staying up to date with these developments is not only challenging, but also critical for ensuring that government services remain efficient, secure, and accessible to all citizens. Senior Minister Dr. William Dugid, who gave the keynote address, says we have to upscale in order to forge ahead in the digital world. Digitization has the potential to drive our economies forward, to literally transform our economies. 
we need to upscale our digital technologies, which will present us with a host of opportunities to help us strengthen and diversify our economies. Embracing digital transformation, that is. The integration of digital technologies into various aspects of society, including businesses, government, education, and healthcare, like in many other countries, can have a significant positive impact and enable growth and economic development in the Caribbean. Wendy Burke, CBC News. Government has launched an initiative to teach young people about the consequences of bad actions. A major part of it is a series of special tours to the prison at Dodds. Ron Brathwaite has more. The initiative is part of government's National Peace Program. Minister in the Office of the Attorney General with responsibility for crime prevention, Corey Lane, provided more details while touring the prison with more than a dozen youth from the program. This initiative, however, is really looking at um, prison experience as part of our consequences um, initiative in the National Peace Program. And what is consequences? In working with young people for a while, looking at the research and understanding the issues, one of the things that we've picked up is that after people come to prison, they say, well, I didn't even know. Because they, they see prison on television. They see prison out of the eyes and mouths of people who return home I don't tell you the whole story because some things are hard, some things are embarrassing. And I thought it important to have this different type of experience and tour. Mr. Lane has also highlighted the success of the Government Peace Initiative and its impact on crime prevention across the country. He's also defended the recent launch of the Reflective Journal's Supply to Prisoners, which has received some public criticism. I think it's important to listen to everything and take constructive criticism because the public thought it was about the donation of crayons when really and truly it was about empowering inmates to write and that has helped us with a number of cases that has helped us with even designing our programs now we can understand some of their deep feelings. The youngsters received some advice from one inmate who has about five more years to serve. That's about 15, bro. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah, really, yeah, really, yeah, school, on school, you know what I mean? school, school is all about, and what you said, everybody, everybody is seeing, so it's so what my influence, you, some of the youth spoke about the experience. All I can say is try your best to keep out of the prison system because it's not easy. It may sound like it, it may look like it, it's not it. Prison is not really the place you want to be, so I advise people to go to school, learn and stop minding friends. And just do what you got to do and keep yourself out of as much trouble as you can. They're seeing things on television and telling themselves that is how it's going, but usually the physical setting is not being the same as what is being televised. So we are bringing them here to the, the present today so it can assist in acting as a deterrent to not end up here. Mr. Lane is encouraging Barbadians, if possible, to visit the prison at Dodds this month during the open days to get a look at its operations. Ron Bathway, CBC News. A high-level conference seeking to find solutions to the region's crime problem gets underway in Barbados this week. The Caribbean Court of Justice Academy for Law 7th Biennial Conference will bring together policymakers, judges, law students, attorneys at law and other key stakeholders starting on Wednesday. It's being held under the theme Criminal Justice Reform in the Caribbean, Achieving a Modern Criminal Justice System. CCJ Judge and Chair of the Academy for Law, the Honorable Mr. Justice Winston Anderson, was a guest on CBC's Morning Barbados, where he explained the theme was selected as the region is living in a pandemic of serious crimes. The society, I think, on the whole, feels very unsafe. We feel unsafe in our homes. So we live behind grilled windows and doors. We feel unsafe in our workplaces. We feel unsafe when we go out into the public. That is an intolerable situation that needs to be addressed. And on the other hand, we have persons who have been accused of crime and who are remanded in custody, sometimes for long periods of time before they get to the court to answer charges, five years, 10 years, sometimes over 15 years, people are held before they get to trial. And again, that is an intolerable situation. Mr. Justice Anderson says the public will also have the opportunity to weigh in during a virtual town hall on Wednesday evening. 
in this town hall, we are hoping that members of the community outside of Barbados, inside and outside of Barbados, within the Caribbean, can call in their concerns, can call in their suggestions for solutions so that we can put our heads together and come up with a raft of recommendations, which a conference at the end on Friday the 20th can endorse and which can then be used as a template going forward for um, our jurisdictions to adopt measures which will alleviate the problem. Government is insisting it will be making strong efforts to put arable land in Barbados back into production. It's coming from Minister of Agriculture Indar Weir, who made the comments at the launch of the Grow Green Initiative as Barbados marks UN World Food Day. Trevor Thorpe has more. They're concerned some landowners are taking arable land out of production for a considerable amount of time and then applying for change of land use. However, Agriculture Minister Indar Weir is sending a strong message to the property holders about the practice. People also need to get off this notion that they can take land out of production for 20 years and then go for subdivision. Um, this minister does not subscribe to that, so they can take their minds off that until I'm gone because it's not going to happen under my watch. And if I'm going to be fair to everybody, I would give you the option of growing grass, that's as far as it goes. I would give you the option of growing energy plants like sugar cane or king grass because we're going to need that in the privatization of the sugar industry. The minister also told the ceremony other challenges develop from unused properties. There's an opportunity for people to do crime. Um, so you're at risk. Um, it encourages monkeys. We need to get them back to their natural habitat. And it encourages dumping, which is a health hazard as well. So however you look at it, those lands we have to get back into production. I think the owners equally have a responsibility in ensuring one, that they don't grow bush, but they can grow pastures. If they grow grass, we can use it for livestock farming. So that is one of the things that they would have to make up their mind about. The minister says more people are aware of the importance of food security as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. You will probably be safer. I can't guarantee you safety, but you will be safer if everybody can eat a food. If people cannot eat, they're going to rob you who they consider comfortable and able to eat. That is going to lead to chaos. It would lead to riots. Minister Bear says prevailing conditions and the calls to feed ourselves are bearing fruit. Trevor Thorpe. CBC News. Well, coming up after this break, a warning for people with high blood pressure and diabetes during the heat wave. A local physician is warning climate change could have a major impact on people's health. Dr. Kenneth Connell was speaking yesterday during a discussion hosted by the Barbados Meteorological Services and the Department of Emergency Management. He says in times of extreme heat, vector-borne diseases like dengue are more prevalent. But he notes people with non-communicable diseases like high blood pressure and diabetes can also be affected. It changes your physiology, it changes the way certain systems in your body works, it, it changes the impact the medications that we prescribe. They're not meant to be prescribed when you're outside dehydrated in the heat. That's not the assumption made. And so changes have to be made to, to the, the treatment. How many people in the room knew that air quality is a direct determinant of for stroke and heart attack? Because we only think about air quality involving the lungs, and, and if its site is, is smoky, then it's, it's only going to put me at risk of an asthma attack. But in New York, we saw as the smoke came across from, from Canada, yeah. uh, the prevalence of strokes went up because air pollution causes vascular responses, and that puts many people at risk of vascular events like heart attacks and strokes. The Barbados Police Service is investigating the death of a 43-year-old man. He was discovered dead at his Bank Hall Main Road residence yesterday morning. He was pronounced dead at the scene by a medical doctor. Police have not yet released the identity of the man. 
A 21-year-old was to appear in court today charged with a spree of burglaries. Andre Leo Clark of Bayfield in St. Philip is charged with four counts of burglary between June and October this year. He's also facing a charge of theft between May 31st and June 4th. According to the police, the burglaries occurred at the St. Catherine Sports Club and other residences within the Bayfield community. Clark is set to appear, well, he was set to appear in the District C uh, Court at St. Matthias today. Regular classes at the Charles F. Broome Memorial Primary School are expected to resume tomorrow after a break, a break in rather, at the Government Hill Institution over the weekend. A statement from the Ministry of Education, Technological and Vocational Training notes affected classes were integrated into nearby locations today. The ministry says doors were kicked in and locks broken. Police responded to the scene and took fingerprints and investigations are ongoing. Repairs were to be carried out on the damaged doors and locks today in anticipation of the resumption of normal classes tomorrow. Horse owners are concerned by what appears to be a rise in theft of their animals. The problem has been highlighted by equine surgeon Dr. Jonathan White, who was a recent victim himself after a female horse and her foal were taken. Uh, Horse owner and equine uh, surgeon Jonathan uh, White had to take a flight home on Friday to join the search for his yearling, um, but yeah, it was successful. Uh, I probably landed around 3 o'clock, 2.30, 3 o'clock, and I was able to, um, with the help of some concerned citizens who had probably been in a similar situation themse themselves, some other horse owners, uh, we were able to track down a little bit of help from the police um, and some other individuals who have some some. Uh, history of uh, of this sort of thing happening. We were able to track down the horse, um, and we got it probably around 5.30, 5, 5, 5.30, uh, and, and we were able to, to get it back home. CBC reported last week on his horse being stolen from its paddock. 30 hours later, it was found. Dr. White says although it is too young to ride or bridle, he believes attempts were made to do both based on its injuries. The damage could have been much worse, um, as well so the horse did have multiple areas of scrapes cuts etc etc on its limb limbs both hind limbs as well as uh, one of the forelimbs luckily they seem relatively superficial but they still require treatment and they certainly weren't there when the horse was quite happily living in its paddock he adds that it was led quite a long way from home since it is only 18 months old and wears no shoes the distance traveled took its toll Dr. White says the horse's treatment will be costly as it will include anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, bandages and fluid therapy as part of the healing process. If you have a small puncture wound, you can get other sequelae such as infection in tendons, uh, tennis sheaths, joints or bursae. And those can make horses very sore um, and obviously require quite significant and, uh, and intense treatment. Other things which horses are very... Um, very sensitive to is tetanus all right so the horse would have been vaccinated for tetanus but wounds on horses um tetanus is always a concern and we always think about their tetanus status dr white continues to work with police on the matter sports time now so we head over to the sports studio where Anne-Marie Burke is standing by with the live details good evening Anne-Marie good evening to you Lisa well it was on the tip of everybody's tongue Mark Venom Griffith retained his men's title while Shelly Waldron is the new women's champion of the Barbados Road Tennis Open when this year's competition came to a close last evening at the Wildy Gym here's a look at the third place and finals matches Let's start the third place playoff games. Ladies first. Kim Holden, the yellow, already stamped authority over Marvely Neblet by taking the first game 21-17. And in the second was even in a more dominant position. That point nicely driven down the line to put her up 17-4. Holder last year's champion wanted to still keep in on the money and using her low cut shots was doing enough to frustrate Neblet and force the errors that equated to points. 19-7 now, two points away. Neblet had some good shots despite on her way to a sow. This was actually the last point she would claim in the match. Nicely timed and placed, leaving Holder floored. But Holder had some shots she pulls out of her back pocket. And this drop shot took her to game and match point. It was sweetly executed. 
Neblet serves. Holder picks it up. But on the return, Neblet hits into the net. And that's, that's it. Kim Holder, last year's champion, this year takes the third place, winning in straight games. The last one won at 21 to 8. The men play the best of five games. This was the third place match between Davian Forsright Taylor here in the white and Antonio Lilman Daniel. This was the fourth game after Daniel won the first 21 8, Taylor the second 21 19, and Daniel the third 21 10. So Daniel knew he needed to shut it down here to get to that $10,000 third place prize. He serves being up 11-4 and despite the quick returns was able to send this one down the line to add another to his points tally. Daniel, known for his stylish lethal shots, was taking no prisoners and inflicting a massacre on Taylor and delivered just what he's known for. Oh yes, Taylor, you just had no response. And Taylor, who had used up all his appeals, was just falling further and further behind, while Daniel kept killing it at every turn. And the crowd was begging for Daniel to deliver some of his signature shots, and he sure did not disappoint. I bet you thought he was going for the kill. Oh no, he switched it up for the soft drop shot. Now that is class. Trying to put Taylor out of his misery and Daniel, who's actually his sparring partner, teased him before finishing off the soul. Taylor hits into the net and Tony Loma Daniel takes third place. The final game he took at 21 to 8. Time now to crown a women's national champion and Sheldon Waldron had already declared that the crown would be hers taking the first game at 21-18. And in the second, Marlene Blunt had fallen behind, although delivering some beautiful shots once the opportunities came. Waldron, who was run up in 2022, meant that 2023 had to be her year. And while Blunt, who has worked so hard to improve her game, was really putting up a fight, Waldron, the more experienced player, showed just why. The nice cross-court shot on this point. The ladies have some long rallies in the mix. You pick up this one with quite a few exchanges. And just in time to see Waldron guide it sweetly down the line to put an end to the back and forth and inch closer to the victory. That put her on 17 to Blunt's 9. The very next play, she showed her class yet again while having a response for every play Blunt sent her way. She just baited the moment to up the ante. Blunt goes for the kill, but instead it skies and watch as Waldron comes to the net and smashes it. So let's wrap it up. This is where Waldron State claimed to the national ladies title. She serves. Blunt returns. One more exchange. Before Blunt had no response, Sheldon Waldron claimed the title that eluded her last year. Let's salute the Coast Guard officer who now has the rank of Women's Barbados Road Tennis Open Champion 2023. And the number one and two seeds battle for the men's title with the number one Mark Venom Griffith and Shaquem Nurse in a rematch of last year's final. Reigning champion Griffith took the first two games at 21-18, so Nurse knew this third was crucial and he picked up Griffith's serve. The gym was quiet as these two had some lengthy exchanges before either someone faltered or found the opening. This time Griffith goes into the net to Nurse's advantage. What this final serve that was rallies galore, the core of Griffith's style of play, and Nurse, knowing his opponent, clearly came in looking to match the energy. And when the youngster got it right, you sure bet he would strike. Nurse then caught a groove and came back into the game in a big way, nicely delivered. Griffith up 19 to 18 and looking for the two points to sew things up. Thought he was in control, but Nurse had a lethal injection and it was now 19 all. But what Griffith has is being calm in the midst of the storm to nurse who deshelves just a bit. And sure enough, Griffith brought it to game and championship point. And this is where he won it in the most anticlimactic of ways. The call comes for out, but he challenges it. And the third umpire is called in. And the ball is adjudged as in. The deal is sealed. Mark Venom Griffith keeps the title of best male road tennis player in BIM as he retains the Barbados Road Tennis Open men's title. In business news tonight, we hear the construction industry is among areas being closely monitored by the Barbados National Standards Institution. The revelation came as the BNSI celebrated its 50th anniversary and marked the start of World Standards Week at the St. Luke's Anglican Church. Trevor Thorpe was there.
Addressing the congregation, Minister Husbands called for a re-energized commitment to the standards that have shaped our lives and that of our nation. Standards may not always be at the forefront of our minds, but they are the invisible thread that weaves through the fabric of our society. They are the benchmarks that ensure the products we use, the services we receive, and the systems we depend on meet the highest levels of quality, safety, and reliability. Standards are the foundation upon which trust, innovation, and progress are built. The minister also highlighted the link between standards and Barbados' thrust towards a greener future. They are essential in ensuring our energy systems are reliable, resilient and environmentally responsible. Chairman of the BNSI, Ryan Bravitt, said businesses must look at putting quality first as standards are constantly evolving. He added that the construction industry is an area of focus for the institution. We are going into a period now where we have to focus on standards as it relates to our construction. Um, we have to ensure that um, businesses put quality first. It is something that will be um, always relevant. So, so the BNSA would remain relevant because we have to ensure that persons conform to these standards. And it is, you know, as we said, 50 years is a long time, but the, in another 50 years, we're going to see um, the evolution of, of more standards, um, more areas that businesses will need to make sure they conform to. A webinar and a forum on front of package labeling are among the topics for discussion during World Standards Week. Trevor Thor, CBC News. Well, meanwhile, we're being told the Barbados National Standards Institution wants what it calls a quality culture to develop on the island. Director Hayden Rind hopes the institution's national quality policy will help advance the process once shared with the public. He says a quality culture is necessary to stay on track with international standards and a large part of it will be the conversion to digital weights and measurements. He was speaking at the BNSI's Visibility Summit. If one of our tradesmen, one of our vendors, gets a large order to supply 450 kilograms of his or her produce per week, and they have no notion of how much is that, what does that mean? How can I measure that with my scale that only reads pounds? The next response is, I can't fulfill that order. I can't meet those requirements. We need to bring our society to where we're understanding the language of the international measurement. And that's what the hard work of Margaret, the whole committee for the Metrology Act has done. The act is, is about to be enacted. It is very, very soon going to be part of our legislation, and I look forward to it. Let's head back over to the sports studio now for the second half in sports. Amory, over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Now, Burger King Clapham Bulls made a clean sweep of the titles as the BABA Summer Jam basketball competition when they won the various finals recently at the Barbados Community College Gym. In the under 14 final, it was their A and B teams who battled it out with the B team prevailing 44 to 35. The under 16 matchup was also an all Bulls affair with the B team again being victorious 55 to 45 and in the on the 19 final bulls triumph over station hill cavaliers 93 82 cbc's anmar goodrich boyce reports burger king clapham b and red taking on bulls a in pink at the bcc gym on the 16 basketball action and we begin with this beauty from jelani marshall his attempt from downtown deserving of a round of applause Zane Gaskin was the main man for Bulls B, driving to the baseline, shifting his marker, and the layup is good. That's two of his game by 30. While Bulls A were trailing 17-12 at the end of the first quarter, and also at the midway stage, this is a quick break. Offensive drive towards the paint, off the backboard and out. Third quarter, and it's a one-point game in favor of Bulls B, but that was momentarily. This one from beyond the arc, Dominic Gardia drains a tray, Bulls A lead by two points. This quarter was very keenly contested. Stevenson Springer bags this one for Bulls A, that's two more. And the response from Bulls B was immediate. Mid-range jumper is on the money. The very next play, Gardia 
Bunks past to Zane Cox. Twists and turns. Can't get his shot to go. But the floater from Travis Mears is good. Momentum started to shift hands again. Great movement from Gaskin. He's under pressure, but makes it look easy. This one extremely close to call. It's tip for tap and Buzz A clap back. Cox moves away from Gaskin and no one can touch it. 32-31. Torres Burrow makes it a three-point contest with this rebound. But how about this from Giardia? My, oh my, it's nothing but net. Even Steven, folks. In the fourth and final quarter, Bulls B was large and in charge. But first, Walton Yarbrough gives Bulls A the slight advantage. However, Bulls B went on a run and finished off with this layup by Tyler Ford as Bulls B defeated Bulls A by 10 points. We move now to the big under-19 showdown. Burger King Clapham Bulls in red and black taking on Station Hill Cavaliers in black and green. The Bulls were on the early charge. Nathan Scott knocks down a three-pointer. Incredible. The Cavs were up against it early on as the Bulls took a five-point lead. A no-luck pass from Simeon Maynard to Zane Gaskin. That's an easy layup. Emil Holderfield got the ball rolling for the Cavs. Steps to the bucket, hesitates, and then puts it in. Two of his 19. The points came easy for the Cavs after. Shoshan Gaskin is left all alone at the three-point line. Makes no mistake. Well, Maynard showed that he wasn't pleased with that one. Goes on the attack, driving to the bucket, and even with a hand in his face, gets it to go. That's the first of his game high, 36. But Maynard goes on a quick break, avoids the block, and rolls it in. And one. Time to flex the muscles. The Cavs never let the Bulls too far out their sight. Hold the field, makes this three count. But this was surely a three-point shooting contest now. Maynard tries his luck from downtown. That's magic as the Bulls lead 50-40 at halftime. The Cavs were down, but not out. Gavin Phillips gets two more to go. Keon Bevel also chipped in. This mid-range jumper is good. The Cavs trail 71 to 62 after the third quarter, and the Bulls went on to stamp their 30, ending with this layup from Josh Harvey as the Bulls charged to victory, 92-82. And Mark Goodrich Boyce, CBC Sports. And that's our news for tonight. On behalf of the entire team, thanks for tuning in. Good night.